And hello, Cardi, VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the podcast, we have an update about the shocking bridge collapse in Baltimore, Maryland, a story about the health of the world seal population, news about education reform in Germany, and a colorful words and their stories with Anna Mateo. We hope you stay with us. Here's Gina Bennett to get us started. In 2007, When a 274-meter-long container ship struck the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, it stood firm. No one died, either on the ship or the road above. The bridge's supports were protected by a fendering system of materials that were designed to soften such a strike. Now, people are asking if such a system or other safety measures could have saved Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. The Key Bridge recently collapsed after the container ship Dolly lost power and struck it. Sharif El Tawil is a University of Michigan engineering professor. He said there are several safety measures that would have made a huge difference had they been in place for the Baltimore Bridge. El Tawil said a fendering system could have softened the 300-meter-long ship's strike. The system includes long tubes called pilings attached to the river bottom that would have helped move the container ship away from the bridge. Another possible protection could have been an island of rocks around the bridge's supports. It may seem like a very large force, El Tawil said of the cargo ship, but I think you can design around it either through a protective system or by designing the bridge itself to have massive towers. Such protections are being questioned after the disaster, which took the lives of six workers on the Key Bridge. Experts say the 47-year-old bridge did not appear to have the protections that are common among newer bridges. The incident is raising questions about how much money American taxpayers are willing to spend to protect against these rare but deadly accidents. And not everyone agrees the key bridge could have been saved. Pete Buttigieg is the Transportation Secretary of the U.S. He recently said at a White House press conference that there has been a lot of debate about whether any of those protections could have avoided the disaster. He said it was a massive strike where the force of about 91,000 metric tons, much larger than a building, hit the bridge. Buttigieg did not directly answer a question about whether steps should be taken to protect the nation's bridges, but he noted that many bridges have been designed to better protect against strikes since a large truck hit Florida's Sunshine Skyway Bridge in 1980. 
That disaster killed 35 people. Baltimore's Key Bridge opened three years before the disaster in 1977. That was a time when container ships were much smaller. In recent years, the ships have grown to carry more containers to save on shipping costs. Mark Luther is a professor at the University of South Florida, or USF, and a director of the USF Center for Maritime and Port Studies. Luther said that to go back and add protections to an existing bridge, like the key bridge, would be extremely costly. He added that to his knowledge, no one has done it. Officials, he said, have accepted that there is a risk with bridges that were built in the 70s with what was then the latest technology. Roberto Leon is a Virginia Tech engineering professor. He said the technology is available to protect a bridge against a strike with a massive cargo ship like the Dolly. But he warned that governments will always be weighing the costs and the risks. He questioned whether anyone would design protections for such a massive strike. He said, would you design it for such an enormous load? Because as the load increases, it becomes much more expensive. I'm Gina Bennett. An ongoing bird flu outbreak has killed tens of thousands of seals and sea lions in several parts of the world. Scientists said the virus's spread also has caused economic losses at poultry farms and is harming wild birds. A worldwide bird flu outbreak began in 2020. It has led to the deaths of millions of domesticated birds and also hit wildlife populations. Health officials have said they do not currently consider the virus a threat to humans. But experts have warned that the continued spread of bird flu could increase the risks to humans. Researchers said seals and sea lions have been affected in areas such as the northeastern state of Maine and the South American nation of Chile. The virus has been identified in seals on both the eastern and western coasts of the United States. At least 300 seals have died from bird flu in New England. Somewhat smaller numbers have died in Washington State's Puget Sound. Experts said the situation is also severe in South America, where more than 20,000 sea lions have died in Chile and Peru. In addition, thousands of elephant seals have died in Argentina. The virus can be controlled in domesticated animals, but it can spread quickly among wildlife and ocean mammals. In South America, for example, seals that have never been infected with the virus have suffered huge losses, said Marcella Uhart. She is director of the Latin America program at the Karen C. Dreyer Wildlife Health Center at the University of California, Davis. Uhart said, Once the virus is in wildlife, it spreads like wildfire, as long as there are susceptible animals and species. 
She said the movement of animals spreads the virus to new areas. Scientists are still researching how the seals got infected, but Uhart said it is most likely from contact with infected seabirds. She noted the death rates have been high in South America since bird flu arrived late in 2022. Birds in Peru and Chile have died from the virus by the hundreds of thousands since then. The worldwide outbreak is continuing, and the virus was even found for the first time in mainland Antarctica in February. Scientists have said bird flu might also have played a part in the deaths of hundreds of endangered Caspian seals in Russia last year. The deaths of seals and sea lions can hurt environments where the sea creatures are near the top of the food chain. Seals help keep the ocean in balance by preventing overpopulation of the fish they feed on. Many of the affected animals, such as South American sea lions and southern elephant seals, have strong populations. But scientists worry about the possibility the virus could jump to more threatened populations. Some scientists and environmental activists say there could be a link between the bird flu outbreak and warming oceans connected to climate change. I'm Brian Lynn. Many European countries have programs that help place students in careers at a young age. In Germany, some students move into education programs at the age of 10. The goal is to prepare them for a lifelong job. They continue their education, but also take classes that will help them learn about their job. By the age of 16, those students are placed into work experience programs called apprenticeships. The system helps keep unemployment among young people low. Groups in the U.S. have expressed interest in the system. They are concerned that the American university system does not prepare young people to enter the workforce. Some activists and writers, such as Ryan Craig, say many of the best jobs the U.S. has to offer don't require a college education. But in Germany, young people are starting to push back against the vocational track system that has been in place in one form or another for hundreds of years. In the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia, students like Nedemann Reim are learning more about jobs before getting on a career track. Reim is 16 years old. She now believes she wants to work with children. But at first, she thought she wanted to work in an office. She did an internship two years ago at an architecture office. But she found that she did not enjoy the work. Then she was placed at a school and worked with children in kindergarten. She discovered that she did not like working with young children. I could see what a day is like with kids, she said. The next school year, she spent three weeks working with older children, helping them finish assignments after school. She felt good about that experience. When she finishes school later this year, she will move into a one-year program that will help her decide if teaching will be the right job for her. The program is called no graduation without connection. Students like Reim get help with resumes and job applications. They receive direction starting in ninth grade. 
By 10th grade, they can get work experience one day per week for the whole school year. Sonia Grzyk is a teacher at Lime School, which is called Ursula Kur. You don't learn about a job in school, she said. You have to experience it. While the German system keeps youth unemployment low, critics have said for years that it does not work well for low-income students and immigrants. They say students from those families are pushed into vocational studies and not helped to move on to higher education. In addition, some say that recent immigrants are not told how to get into the training programs. Another criticism of vocational training is that during the COVID-19 pandemic, most of those classes shut down. At the same time, university classes continued by video, and students did not lose too much. Studies in Germany show that problems with vocational training have led more students to university educations. However, up to 28% of students do not finish their studies. The number is up to 50% for students in humanities and sciences. People involved in education policy in Germany are concerned about the high failure rate. So, they are aiming to reform the vocational training system. Lime's program is one of the new ones, where students have more choices when deciding on a career and more chances for exploration before entering a career studies program. Bernhard Meyer is a teacher at Lime's school who manages the new program for 11 towns in northwestern Germany. We have every type of possibility, he said, noting that students have more choices than just apprenticeship or university. Students in Rhymes program can complete their general education and also start a career they feel good about. It is unusual for students in higher-level academic high schools called gymnasiums to bypass university studies, but it does happen. Tim Becker, 20, is one of those students. He took a university entrance exam at his high school in Cologne, but instead of starting his studies, he is doing an information technology apprenticeship. Becker said his parents were uneasy about his choice. They expected him to go on to higher education. But in school, he said he liked hands-on work more than academic theory. I am just not that guy that likes to sit all day in any lectures at some university, Becker said. He added that some of his old classmates left their universities to start internships. The students at Ursula Kur and their parents attend meetings several times per year. As they learn more, parents feel better about the career choices of their children. Mile Glisic is 15. He is working at a hardware store and considering an apprenticeship in sales. He said his parents had questions about his career ideas, but I know that they were very happy with it. Chaim's mother said she loved the idea that her daughter would teach in a grade school, and Chaim said the teachers help their students gain confidence. They don't want anyone to finish school and have nothing. Other European countries are struggling with the same questions. Camilo Hooters is head of the National Center for Vocational Education, a research organization in Denmark. She said, The country has a shortage of workers in fields that offer vocational training to young people. That only became a problem starting after the 1990s. That is when Denmark scored poorly on an international education ranking list and more students started thinking about college. But now, Danish students as young as six are being shown different jobs so they can start thinking about a career path. Hooters said 
programs are starting to make practical learning part of school in the early grades and continuing it through college. Danish leaders are asking universities to work with businesses. College degrees are still the goal for many Danish students and their parents. So there is a little bit of mixed tendency in Denmark, Hooters said. More young people in Denmark might take the path of Becker in Germany. He earns over $1,300 per month during his information technology internship and will be ready for a job as soon as September. Becker said, It is nice to be able to get paid to learn, unlike some of his friends who are at a university. He said, You don't need to sit all day in university and go to work in the evening to pay your bills. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Jill Robbins. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On today's show, we talk about colors. Sometimes we talk about our feelings with words describing colors. For example, if I am feeling down or a bit sad, I can say I am blue. If I'm angry, I might say that I see red. If I'm out of sorts or really unhappy, I can say I'm in a black mood. If I want something that someone else has, I can say I'm green with envy. All these different feelings can be represented with colors. But what about your true colors? What does it mean to show your true colors? If we show our true colors, we are true to ourselves. We show what we are really like. We reveal our true nature, character, or personality. For example, I have a friend who loves the sun and sea. When she is at the beach, she shows her true colors. She's very active, swimming in the sea, walking along the beach, and enjoying other outdoor activities. When she is away from the beach, she doesn't seem herself. She is often inside and not very active. However, showing one's true colors does not always mean something good. Some people may present themselves in a way other than how they really are. They might seem to have positive characteristics. They act kind, pleasant, generous, or helpful. But in fact, they are really the opposite. They are not showing their true colors. They keep their true nature hidden. Let's listen to this example. You know, I thought Mac was easygoing, but then I worked with him on a big project. I know exactly what you mean. He's easygoing and fun to work with when he gets his way. But if you question any of his ideas, he shows his true colors. That is exactly what happened. I suggested an alternative to his idea and he became really rude and mean. Some word experts say the expression true colors dates back to the 1700s and comes from the world of sailing ships. Colored flags were, and still are, used to show what country a ship was registered to and to communicate with other ships at a distance. The ship's colors were its flags. Pirates' ships would sail under false colors, meaning under a friendly flag. They would do this to get close to other ships without raising concern. Then, when the pirates were close enough and ready to attack, 
they would raise their true colors. Another expression with a similar meaning is to show your stripes. Stripes can be your true nature and something you cannot hide or remove. However, this expression is less common. Here is an example. Marissa showed her true stripes when her back was against the wall. When she had no way out of the problems that she had created, she blamed everyone. Everyone but herself, that is. And that's this week's Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Podcast. Let's welcome Ana Mateo to the studio. She's here to tell us some more about this week's words and their stories. Welcome, Ana. Hello, Dan. Thanks for having me on your show. So first question, what is your favorite color? That's easy. Deep indigo blue with an accent of turquoise blue. And do you know why it's my favorite color? Well, first of all, that's a very precise answer, and I have no idea why it's your favorite color. Why is it your favorite color, Anna? It is very precise. It's not general blue. It's a very specific two types of blue. They are the main colors of peacocks, a bird that I find incredibly beautiful. Some peacocks even have a little shockingly bright pink, another favorite color of mine. What about you, Dan? What is your favorite color? Anna, people who know me might think my favorite color is orange. That's because one of the universities I went to uses orange as its school color. But do you know what? My true favorite color is probably pink. I have a lot of pink things. Like I have some pink arm warmers. When I ride my bike, when it's cold, I put the pink arm warmers on. And uh, my bike also has some handlebar tape that you can cushion your hands with if you're riding for a long distance. And that's pink, too. So people who know me really well might say it's pink. And you know, Dan, it's interesting that you mention your true favorite color, because this week, We talked about the phrase to show your true colors. Well, isn't that a coincidence? Anna, let me ask you, what does it mean to show your true colors? When someone shows their true colors, they show who they really are. Their true nature comes out. Some people try to hide that, but you can't hide your true self for very long. Eventually, it will come out. For example, let's say someone is always talking about how they like to help their friends, especially when their friends need them the most. But then when a storm severely damages a friend's house, this person is suddenly too busy to help them repair it. You know, Dan, during an emergency is often when people show their true colors for good and sometimes for bad. You mentioned this very specific kind of blue color. Someone who is true blue is thought to be very loyal. Right, Anna? Absolutely. And that could be a whole other words in their stories. Yeah, that's a great expression. Well, so as we wrap up uh, the show this week, we want to thank all of our true blue listeners out there. The true blue listeners who show us their true colors by coming back to words in their stories every week. So thanks to all our true blue VOA listeners out there for spending some time with us this week to learn about true colors. Thanks, everyone. And thanks to you, too, Anna. Always a joy, Dan. Thank you very much. Bye. And that's the Learning English podcast for today. Thanks again, Anna, and thanks to all my VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, 
Thank you for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm...